Hi everyone! It's Dr. Mara Evangelista Huber, a board-certified dermatologist, a dermatopathologist with a master's in clinical trials. Today, we are going to talk about a highly requested and very popular topic on my Instagram, and that is melasma. Before we discuss melasma, I'd like to briefly talk about the pigment in our skin. I want everyone to know that pigment in our skin is not only normal, it is also needed. Melanin is the compound that gives our hair, our eyes, our skin its color. And melanin is actually quite important because it protects from the harmful rays of the sun. And the sun's rays may actually cause, as you already know, sunburn, skin aging, and also skin cancer. So melanin is made by cells called melanocytes in our skin. These melanocytes produce melanin in a series of steps catalyzed by an enzyme called tyrosinase. In fact, many disorders of hyperpigmentation tell tyrosinase to produce more melanin. That's why you have more pigment. And this is also a target of a lot of treatments that want to address melasma and other forms of hyperpigmentation. Once melanin is produced by these melanocytes, they transfer it to cells called keratinocytes, which are the majority of our skin cells. I also get asked a lot what the difference is between hyperpigmentation and melasma. So hyperpigmentation refers to when the skin experiences an excess amount of pigment. So basically hyperpigmentation is a descriptive term and it's not really a diagnosis. Melasma is a type of hyperpigmentation. So what exactly is melasma? Melasma is a disorder of pigmentation. It's very common and it happens in adults. It generally manifests as grayish or brownish patches that are darker than the surrounding normal skin. You find these usually in sun-exposed areas, particularly the face. On the face, you would often see it on the forehead, the nose, the cheeks, the upper lip, and also the chin. Less commonly, you can find it in non-facial areas, such as your neck and your chest. Melasma tends to be chronic, so long-term, long-lasting. Some patients experience it for years. It tends to develop very slowly. That's why it happens during adulthood. And it also tends to recur even if you treat it. Anyone can develop melasma. However, there are people who are more at risk at developing this condition. This would include number one, women, particularly during pregnancy. Number two would be people with a darker skin phototype. Number three would be Asian, Hispanic, African, and Indian ethnicities. And lastly, those people who live in areas with really high sun exposures. So now that we've discussed who is at risk for melasma, we now want to know what triggers melasma, specifically in people who are already at risk for it. The number one trigger of melasma is ultraviolet radiation from the sun. In fact, melasma is more common or gets worse during the summer, and it improves its appearance or disappears during winter. Another major trigger for melasma is hormones, particularly the female hormone estrogen. So much so that pregnant women develop melasma quite commonly. About 70% of patients can develop melasma when they're pregnant. Also those who are using oral contraceptive pills because that's um, an external source of hormones or any form of hormonal therapy, these individuals may also be prone to developing melasma. And lastly, genetics may also play a role in why one person may really be prone to developing melasma. Now to be clear, melasma is not an inherited condition. However, some studies have shown that it is more common in those patients with a family history of melasma. So to reiterate, the major triggers of melasma include ultraviolet radiation from the sun, hormones, and genetics. Now there are also less characterized triggers of melasma, things that need more studies to establish their actual effect on the condition. This would include visible light and infrared light. So let me just briefly talk about light. Light is a spectrum that is composed based on wavelengths of ultraviolet radiation on the short end, visible light or light that we can see 
at the center and infrared light on the longer end. Basically, the shorter the wavelength, the higher the energy and the more potential to damage the skin. Ultraviolet light has the shortest wavelength and the highest energy among the three. This is also the most studied among those three types in terms of its effects on the skin. Blue light is closest to UV in terms of wavelength, which is why it's also called high energy visible light. We don't see infrared light, but we can feel it as heat. Now what I want you to know is that the predominant source of all light on Earth is the sun. And yes, that includes blue light. Blue light from artificial lights such as your light bulbs or devices such as your cell phones and laptops, it's tiny compared to the blue light emitted by the sun. I wouldn't really worry about blue light from these devices because visible light isn't even as characterized in terms of its effects on the skin, especially compared to ultraviolet light. How much more so for tiny doses from our devices and artificial lights? So to emphasize, there are only a few studies investigating the effects of visible light and infrared light on melasma. And many of these have been done on those with darker skin types who are actually already at risk of developing melasma. So other things that are considered to potentially worsen melasma would be things that increase oxidative stress on our skin, such as pollution and smoking, those that increase blood flow in our skin, such as exercise, and also skincare products and topical or oral medications or drugs. We often just diagnose this clinically just by looking at it, we can see if it is melasma or not. However, there are challenging cases where we might do other workups, such as look at it under a light called Woods Light, or take a sample of your skin and look at it under the microscope to rule out other causes of hyperpigmentation. Melasma may also be a symptom of a medical condition, or an effect of a drug that you are taking. So how do we treat melasma? First, I want to say that melasma is actually quite challenging to treat. Uh, this is very important going forward so that you understand if it might recur after treatment. The multifactorial nature of melasma requires different types of treatments to target the different reasons or the different mechanisms for why it even exists in the first place. Melasma treatments fall into the following categories, and these can be used together. Please remember, the choice of treatment really depends on the patient. For example, the severity of your melasma would let us know how we're going to approach it. Have you failed certain treatments before? Are you getting worse with certain active ingredients? So all of these come into play when we formulate a treatment plan for you. So one of the foundations of melasma treatment is to prevent triggers. And that's why sun protection and sun avoidance is very important. If maybe your contraceptive pills or hormonal therapy is causing it, we would probably suggest that you go back to your OB or your prescribing doctor and see if we can remove it or replace it with something else. If a medical condition is also causing the melasma, then of course we need to address that medical condition. Or if it's a side effect of a drug, then we're also going to see if we can remove that drug or replace it with something else that will not trigger your melasma. The second type of treatment falls under melanocyte-centered treatments, primarily by decreasing melanin synthesis or by decreasing the transfer of melanin from your melanocytes to your keratinocytes. And another way to treat melasma would be to address the non-melanocyte components of the condition, such as exfoliating the pigmented keratinocytes, reducing inflammation or free radical production, restoring and protecting your skin barrier, among others. This is the suggested flowchart in how to approach melasma. So as you can see, sun protection and topical agents or products that you apply on the skin would be first line. If patients do not respond to this, then we can think of adding in-office procedures such as your chemical peels, microneedling, laser and light-based therapies. Other adjunctive treatments would include systemic or oral agents, such as medications, which include your tranexamic acid, and supplements that are generally focused on the antioxidant effects, such as your polypodium leucotomus and procyanidin, among others. When it comes to sun protection and melasma, this is really important because not only can it trigger melasma to occur, it can actually worsen existing melasma, 
or make melasma that has already responded to treatment recur. So how do we select sunscreens for those affected with melasma? You would like to look for an SPF ideally 50 and above because that gives you higher UVB protection and high UVA protection. UVA protection is indicated by PPD ratings, PA ratings, boot star ratings, or the term broad spectrum. The recent guideline suggests that the UVA and UVB protection should be as close to one as possible. So basically, higher UVA protection, the better. Now, as I have mentioned, many of the studies that suggest an association with visible light and melasma are focused on those with darker skin types. Now, if you're at risk, of course, the question is how do you then protect yourself from visible light? Commercially available filters don't appreciably protect from visible light. What has been shown to protect against visible light is iron oxide. Now, iron oxides are found as colorants in many cosmetics. Now, where do you find iron oxides? Yes, you can find them in tinted sunscreens, but not only tinted sunscreens. You can find them in tinted moisturizer, foundation, makeup, pressed powder, and other skincare products. So if tinted sunscreens are not for you, you can always use the other products I've mentioned to protect against visible light. There are also some studies suggesting that antioxidants may also repair the potential damage that visible light and infrared light may cause because these have been believed to produce free radicals that can trigger melasma formation in those with dark skin. Now, avoiding the sun would really limit exposure to all types of lights that I've mentioned, ultraviolet, visible, and also infrared. So I always recommend that to my patients with melasma. Avoid the sun, particularly at high exposures during midday or at noon. Wear a hat, use an umbrella, and seek shade whenever the sun is really high. Sun protective clothing is also helpful, as well as protective shields that you can attach to your windows. Now when it comes to treatment, the ones with the highest level of evidence are actually dermatological drugs, such as your hydroquinone and triple combination cream, which will include hydroquinone, a tretinoin, and a steroid. Hydroquinone-based treatments cannot be used long-term, but they can be used alternating with non-hydroquinone-based treatments. These are best used under the supervision of a medical professional because side effects may occur if not used judiciously. Now there are second-line topical agents or actives that may be used. For example, if number one, you can't tolerate hydroquinone-based treatments. Number two, they're not available. Number three, as alternating treatment with your hydroquinone-based treatments. And number four, as maintenance therapy. Now, combinations of these second-line agents are generally better than one agent alone. This is a nice table showing you the different topical agents available for the treatment of melasma. You can see that they target different steps in the melasma pathogenesis, which is why combinations of these agents are generally better than just single agents so that they can attack melasma from different angles. If you are not responding to topical therapy or if your melasma is severe, there are things that you can add on to your topical therapy, which will include your in-office treatments and your oral supplements or drugs. Now, as a final word, there is no cure for melasma, but there are treatments that can improve the way that it looks. It's really best to initiate treatment when melasma is mild because more severe cases are harder to treat. Adherence to your prescribed regimen, patience while waiting for results, and realistic expectations go a long way. I also highly suggest consultation with a board-certified dermatologist to create a specific individualized treatment plan for you where we can attack melasma from different angles. And that's it. Thank you so much for listening. For more information, I have a thorough post on melasma in my Dermatology IG. Thanks for listening. Bye!